Okay, we, we left off talking about subliminal perception. In fact, I think the first part cut off. So we're talking about can things be perceived um, below the threshold of, uh, of perception, um, sort of unconsciously, I guess you could say. And research says that, yes, things can be perceived um, beneath the, the threshold. And it can affect behavior, but the power is what's questioned. Can it really influence consumer behavior in terms of can subliminal ads um, inserted below the threshold of consciousness, can that actually cause me to buy a product or can it change my behavior in any kind of way? Um, research shows that it can. Uh, it says information or influence information below a level of conscious awareness. In 1957, uh, James Vickery, an advertising exec, announced that he was able to increase popcorn and soft drink sales by secretive, secretively flashing the words, eat popcorn or drink Coke on a movie screen in a local theater. And this is all just a, a bunk. He basically did not have research to, to ver verify these claims. But it kind of set into motion this idea about, you know, can we use this type of... Uh, of thing within advertising. Strahan does demonstrate that it actually does work. It says studies have shown that the brain responds to information that is presented below the conscious threshold. Such information can also influence behavior. In one study, researchers randomly assigned participants to observe either words related to being thirsty or control words of the same length being flashed on a computer screen for 16 milliseconds while they performed an unrelated task. All of the participants thought they were participating in a taste test, taste test study, and all were thirsty. It says none of the participants reported seeing the flashed words, but when given a chance to drink a beverage afterward, those who had seen thirst-related words drank more. Research has also supported the notion of people's uh, performance on learning tasks uh, is affected by stimuli that are too faint to be recognized at the conscious level. Um, and this was really popular in marketing back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, not used today so much. I think what they found out is it's kind of a waste of time because the actual behavior doesn't, uh, it's not strong enough to influence us enough to actually use this process. So most of the ads that you guys are going to see in the Super Bowl uh, are not using uh, subliminal perception. And um, there's other things we're going to talk about in chapter five on learning about classically conditioned. They're going to, we're going to talk about how you're conditioned into wanting to buy something or vote for somebody. That does work, and it's not subliminal. It's right in front of us, but we often um, don't realize the effects it can have on us. And we'll talk about that at a later date. Signal detection theory is another idea. And basically, um, this theory suggests that sensory thresholds are not fixed characteristics of subjects, but in fact shift depending on the motives and moods. Whether we can tell that something is there depends on how much more and how sensitive our receptors are. The question there, you know, did I detect something? Um, and trying to figure out if you did indeed. These factors include individual contextual variations such as fatigue, how tired you are at that moment, your expectations of what you're supposed to hear, see, or taste, and, and also the urgency um, that factors into being able to actually detect. Information acquisition criterion, basis of uh, motive for judgment. So um, signal detection theory, um, a little bit better than the subliminal perception theory. Some things that affect attention, uh, when we're attending to something, how do we pay attention and um, what are some things that can kind of happen as we're using our uh, cognitive attention. Focusing our awareness on a narrowed aspect of the environment, so we're specifically listening to a person in a conversation or we're specifically looking at this uh, screencast video and trying to take in the information. We are, are we're giving it good attention there. What is the average attention span of a person? You know, studies say 15 to 20 minutes is maximum that you can give really strong, focused, direct attention. So we have lectures that are hour and 15 minutes. Um, yes, we lose people at 15 minutes and 20 minutes. And no, we have to kind of take mental breaks and refocus, and then we can kind of get back into giving it uh, our our undivided attention, selective attention. Um, the cocktail party effect. Somebody's talking directly to us, but we don't hear a word they're saying. Uh, I've been in a coffee house with my wife, and she's telling me a long 
story about something and I'm going, yes, uh -huh, I'm paying her lip service because I, I want her to think that I'm listening, right? So um, I'm not, though, because the people behind me are having a fight, and it's really good, you know? And at some point, she looks and she says, so what should I do? And I'm like, huh? Um, what do you think you should do? And then she, she says, you haven't heard a word I'm saying, have you? And I said, no, but have you heard these people behind us? It's really, really good. You know, cocktail party effect. You're listening to some other conversation, but you're engaged, you know, verb, your nonverbals, your, your facial expressions. You can deliver all that while you're selectively attending to something else. Um, attention shiftable. Uh, noticing someone's texting next to you. You're sitting in class. You're trying to pay attention. Somebody starts texting. You glance over. You notice in your peripheral. And for a second there, you know, you kind of want to know what they're doing or want to kind of uh, attend to it, but you can simultaneously still kind of pay attention to the lecture or what you're trying to focus on. So it kind of tells us, it says monitoring many things at once. We're monitoring things we're, we're, uh, while we're also paying attention directly to something. It gives us the ability to kind of take in other things from our environment. And some things might be important to, to pick up on. Uh, we pay attention to novelty situations. Something that's new grabs our attention. Something that's different unusual we haven't seen before it definitely does grab our attention larger things in size uh, grab our attention um, color vivid um, um, just abstract those kind of things might grab us something that that stands out color wise uh, movements obviously emotions of other people these things all you know grab our attention automatically really without us having to kind of signal ourselves or tell our brain to focus no it just just does it we notice these things Inattentional blindness. Um, you guys watched a video, test your awareness. This explains it. This is why this happens. Um, inattentional blindness can happen um, while we're texting and driving. It can happen um, when we are focused on something so closely that we miss something that's totally in front of us. Um, watch the video it's uh yeah it's based on a classic video that was done on throwing a basketball and counting the number of times and this is sort of a test your awareness and it's it's funny what it's kind of an awareness ad for actually very cleverly done sustained attention focused and extended attention with an object task event or other aspect of environment so just being able to sustain it and maintain it on one thing um, you know, uh, attention deficit issues come up. We know um, some of us might struggle with attention deficit. In children, we hear about ADHD quite a bit. And yeah, it has to do with the cognitive ability to sustain attention and how we're so easily distracted by things. Um, that's something that we study in, in Chapter 12 on mental disorders. And But again, uh, there are issues with our attention. And, and some of us that think we're great multitaskers, something has to give. Um, we might be able to do that well to a certain extent, but you cannot simultaneously give enough amount of, of your mental activity to those four or five different things. Um, something's got to give, and, and uh, so can make it difficult. I'm a horrible multitasker, by the way. I, I, I ha if I'm um, doing something and somebody's talking to me, I don't hear a thing they're saying. You know, Students get frustrated with me when I first come to class, and I'm trying to get the my lecture together and I have a question on the front row and I, I hear, you know, wah, 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 somebody, I, I detect somebody saying something to me, but I have no idea. I did not comprehend what they're saying and then they get a little frustrated and then I go, okay, now what were you saying to me? And, and, you know, I have to give them my full attention. I'm just not good at the whole multitasking thing. Executive attention, action planning, allocating attention to goals, error detection, compensation, monitoring process to task, dealing with new or novel things or difficult circumstances. Um, executive attention is really important for us to, to maintain. Um, research on inattentional blindness. I was just mentioning that. Um, the uh, test your awareness video. Now here's some research suggests the dangers of multitasking. Well, one of the tasks is driving kind of a no-brainer there. Um, engaging, it's funny, we all jump in our cars, we turn on the music, we're, we're checking our phone, we're lighting up a cigarette, we are doing multiple things, we're not looking behind us, we whip out, we're, you know, this is kind of automatic processing, a future chapter you learn about automatic processing. We don't have to focus on each thing specifically, we automatically do these things. But is our attention, kind of get important attention getting lost in the multiple things we're doing in our car? 
Um, research revealed that individuals who text message while they drive face 23 times the risk of crash or near crash compared to non-distracted drivers. In this research, cameras continuously observed drivers for more than 6 million miles of driving. Texting drew the driver's eyes away from the road long enough for the vehicle to travel the length of a football field, that's 100 yards, at 55 miles an hour. Pretty phenomenal there. Cultural effects on attention and perception. Um, the chapter takes a look kind of at Americans versus Japanese or Asian cultures. And there's a difference in how they perceive based on culture, which is kind of interesting. Research shows that culture influences which stimuli we attend to as we perceive the world. Individuals from Western cultures, ourself and, and many of the European countries, Canada, are more likely to attend to objects in the foreground of scenes or focal objects, things that jump out in the front or large objects in the front. While, while East Asians looking at the same scenes are more likely to notice aspects of context. Now, some people think it kind of has to do with um, individualistic cultures like ourselves versus collectivist cultures. Um, we're kind of taught from an early age um, about individualism, and it, it, it kind of gets um, perpetuated into our culture at large, uh, where in Asian cultures or Japan, um, more on the group. It's even in our language. Uh, Americans say I and use I more frequently in their language than um, what reachers research has shown us with um, collectivistic societies like Japan where it's we and us and group uh, even in the language itself and how we use it so uh, we it causes us to perceive differently um, that cultural influence on us through all these years of it being ingrained actually does affect the way we see the world and experience it and interpret the things perceptual sets something important to y'all predisposition or readiness to perceive something in a particular way. Uh, it says perceptual sets act as psychological filters in processing information about the environment. Perceptual sets reflect top-down influences on perception. If you look at the playing cards uh, in your textbook, it kind of gives you a good experiment you can kind of do yourself uh, to kind of demonstrate perceptual set. Uh, one example, or another example rather, that ambiguous stimuli I gave you all at the very beginning of uh, part one, um, the old woman, young woman. Had I told you guys before I set that up, I'm going to show you guys a picture of an old woman, then the majority of y'all would have seen the old woman first. You would have perceived her first because I gave it to you. I put it in your perceptual set. So it's going to influence the way you interpret that. Had I done it the other way around and said, okay, I'm going to show you guys a picture of a young woman, then the first image you would see in that ambiguous stimuli would be the old woman. Uh, I'm sorry, the young woman. What I give you influences what you'll then perceive later. Sensory adaptation, uh, change in responsiveness to sensory system. Um, you adjust to the water in initially freezing water. You get used to it. You accommodate it. You, you, know, um, you turn on your windshield wipers while driving, and shortly you are unaware of their rhythmic sweeping back and forth then you might get in tune with it. It says when you first enter a room, you might be bothered by the hum of the air conditioner, but after a while you get used to it. I used to live in a house in Abita Springs, uh, Louisiana. I rented this house, and apparently the well wasn't dug deep enough. Um, the, the quality of the water was fine. You could drink it and everything, but it smelled like sulfur. So you had that egg smell to it. And I, it, I noticed it right away, and I was like, whoa, i got to brush my teeth in this water, bathe in this water? Am I going to reek like eggs the rest of the day? No, it dissipates very quickly. But you're aware of it. You smell it. You sense it. You perceive it. But after a couple of weeks of living there, I didn't perceive it. I didn't smell it anymore. Uh, sensory adaptation. I adapted to my environment. I adapted to the smell. Um, if you move next to a railroad tracks, uh, the train might wake you up in the middle of the night. But after you live there, you 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 adapt to it. You're able to do that. Um, smell. I have some friends that live in Bogalusa and. Uh, the paper mill there gives off a smell, and if you're not from there, you notice it. But my friend said, you know, after a couple of weeks, he didn't really even notice it that much. It, it didn't have a negative effect anymore. Last thing I'm going to leave you guys with, um, the rest of the chapter looks at, you know, the different structures of the eye, uh, the hearing process, a lot of other things I'm going to let you guys just read about. 
Um, this other thing I wanted to mention at the bottom here it says feature detectors. Specialized cells in the brain that respond only to certain sensory information. Studies have found feature detectors in the temporal and occipital lobes that respond maximally to faces. Damage in the area can, call, can cause something called prosopagnosia or face blindness, which is a big issue for people. And that's something you guys took a look at. I had another video that I showed um, on that. But um, yeah, they can. They know they're looking at a face, but they can look away and then they cannot reconstruct the face. There's some problem with the signal not getting out. Um, very big mystery in, uh, in uh, this issue.